So I'm going to start today on uh, monophyletic transformation. And I'd like to begin by having a little bit of a brainstorming session. In other words, tell me what you understand by monophyletic, and I'll write it down on the board. It's a metastable phase. It's a metastable phase. Okay, anything else? Steel. Sorry? Steel. Okay, form uh, is steel. Forms at the speed of sound. Sorry, what, what did somebody say? Forms at the speed of sound. Speed of sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're now faster than I can write again. <laughs> speed of sound. Um, rapidly, somebody said? Yeah. Uh, diffusionless. Anything else? Displacive. That's a very interesting point. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, or second. Or yeah. Highest. Highest. Do you mean that it's strong? <laughs> Okay, yeah. So hard or strong. Anything else? Uh, there may be a transformation pretty. to get on with. Now, the purpose of brainstorming is just to sort of define without thinking too much what we believe about modern sight. And I'm going to show you that the vast majority of this is not actually strictly correct. <laughs> so, what I'm going to do in the lecture today is to present to you all the characteristics of modern sight. And we will end up by feeling extremely confused because we will see lots of contradictions, right? Yes. And, and I want you to understand those contradictions and we will solve those contradictions in the next lecture. So I began by saying what do we understand by Martin Sabic transformations, what are its characteristics and I will keep this list over here. First of all, Martin side is not restricted to steel. It is very, very important in steels, but it is certainly not restricted to steels. So it's correct that it forms in steels, but it's incorrect that it is restricted to steels. So here is a list of, a conservative list of materials in which we get martensitic transformation. So zirconia, for example, will undergo martensitic transformation when you cool it below 1200 Kelvin. MS here stands for the margin side start temperature, that means the temperature at which margin static transformation first begins during cooling. And do you know of any application of margin static transformations in ceramics? Sorry? <coughs> the piezoelectric is not a margin static transformation, it's when you deform a crystal which doesn't have a center of symmetry. Uh, you get a charge developing. But it is, in a sense, it doesn't involve diffusion. Yeah. But it's not a phase change, it's simply a distortion. Now, have you heard about transformation toughening? Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, if you have a crack, you've got a stress field around mm -hmm. the crack. If that has to do work to change the crystal structure, in other words, if it induces transformation, then you're toughening the material. And ceramics are generally not very tough. So they might have a toughness of uh, half a megapascal root meters, but inducing Martin City transmission, you can triple that. It's still a low toughness, but it's much better than it used to be. Uh, okay, so, and notice that this is, of course, extremely hard. HV stands for Vickers Hardness. Uh, this is a steel with containing 31% nickel, an incredibly low Martin side start temperature. So one of the things that people also say is that martensite occurs at low temperatures. Now, of course, that isn't 
necessarily true. Here we have modern zeta transformation happening at 1200 K, but here's a case where it's happening at a low temperature. So martensite can form at an incredibly low temperature. Here's a case where it forms at 4 Kelvin. Now, the importance of that is that, of course, if it forms at a very low temperature, then diffusion can be ruled out. Uh, here is another case where we have 500 Kelvin. This is a copper aluminium alloy which undergoes martensitic transformation. And this is an argon nitrogen solid solution which undergoes martensitic transformation at 30 Kelvin. So <coughs> the transformation is not limited to steels. It is of the greatest technological importance in steels, but you can get it in many <coughs> different materials. It can happen over a wide range of temperatures and it need not be strong. Here is copper aluminum. It's got a hardness which is very low, 200 vicars. So we need to explain why particular kinds of martensite are strong. If I removed the carbon from here, this martensite would drop remarkably in terms of its strength. What exactly is vicar surface? Okay, so what you do is you make an indentation on the surface using a diamond. Okay, and the diamond has a particular shape and included an angle of 136 degrees. And you use a well-defined load to make that indentation. So the depth of that indentation indicates how strong your material is. Okay, so let, let me just show you that. This, for example, is an indentation made with that diamond with a specific, a specific load. You then measure the distances across the diagonal and that, because of the geometry of, of the material, when you measure, of the indenter, when you measure the distance across there, it's proportional to the depth of penetration. And that is an indication of how strong your material is how much it resists plastic deformation. So it's a very neat way uh, of measuring strength because this indentation is really quite small. Okay, maybe less than a millimeter in size. So you're not destroying your sample by measuring its hardness. Now we've got a, a hardness testing machine near the part 2 laboratory and you can go and have a look. Ask the class technician to show you exactly how it works. It's a very important technique, so it's nice to know about it. So it isn't true that martensite is hard. If I have martensite in pure iron, it will be incredibly soft. It is the carbon in the martensite that forms in iron that gives it the hardness. And that's the reason why when you temper it, hardness drops. But martensite per se is not hard. Not particularly hard, I should say. So this is not necessarily true, and this is not necessarily true either. Everyone happy with that? Okay. Now, I said to you that martensite happens in many different things. So the way that a virus attacks a bacterium also involves martensite transformation. So imagine that this is your virus, and it actually looks something like this. You know, there's a head, there's effectively a hypodermic needle there, and in effect a couple of arms there, and those arms latch on to a bacterium, and this hypodermic needle, which is a cylindrical crystal, undergoes martensite transformation, so it becomes short and fat from long and thin. And in doing so, it punches the bacterium and passes on its DNA, which then multiplies inside the bacterium. Okay, so viruses don't actually mate, they infect and multiply. And this is a, the cylindrical crystal which undergoes martensitic transformation to operate that hypodermic needle. And this is a real picture of the virus, the hypodermic needle, and here it's infecting a bacterium. So martensitic transformations are quite general. 
that simply involve a deformation of the lattice rather than a lattice change by diffusion. And the deformation is driven not by a stress, it can be driven by a stress, but it's driven by the fact that the product crystal structure is more stable. But it can't transform by an equilibrium mechanism because we are operating at a very low temperature where diffusion is not possible. Okay? Uh, all the shape memory alloys uh, that you, know, you can buy spectacles which you can bend like this and so forth and so on, they are nickel titanium alloys. Yeah, so it might inside in many, many different things. Okay, now I'd like you to tell me what the evidence is for diffusionless transformation. So this actually is correct. So what is the evidence that martensite forms without any diffusion? It forms at very low temperatures, or it can form at very low temperatures for Kelvin. Anything else? It forms so fast. Sorry? It forms really fast. There isn't time. Yeah, it can form really fast. Right. Right. I, I mean, you're both right that the lattice is changed by deformation, but that conclusion we draw from the fact that it's diffusionless. Okay. So, you know, it isn't evidence for diffusionless transformation, but we draw that conclusion from the fact that it's diffusionless. So, if I list, uh, we've got the fact that it can form at very low temperatures, it can grow extremely rapidly. Now, we said that martensite grows at the speed of sound. Okay, and do you know roughly what the speed of sound in... Sorry, it's louder, please. Well, that's all about 2,000 meters per second. 2,000 meters per second, okay. Uh, roughly. Meters per second. Now, it can grow that rapidly, but you can also make it grow slowly. So when you're looking at your shape memory metals, if you bend the thing gently, then the interface will move gently. So just like it can form at low temperatures, it can also form at high speeds, but it does not necessarily form at a high speed. But of course, this is also a very obvious indication that the transformation is diffusionless, and that is that if we measure the chemical composition of the margin side, it's exactly the same as that of the parent phase. And the parent phase, we use the general expression austenite, even if when we are not dealing with steam. How would you measure the chemical composition? What are the techniques that allow you to measure the chemical composition of an individual plate? Yeah, you could use uh, you know energy dispersive X-ray analysis, wavelength dispersive X-ray analysis, and a whole variety of techniques which now allow you to even analyze a single atom. Okay. You know, time of flight mass spectrometry. You pull out the atoms, you find out how long they take to fly between two points, and therefore you identify what they are. Okay. So on the highest resolution experiment that we can do, which is an individual atom, the transformation is truly diffusionless. Okay, so that's the evidence for diffusionless transformation. Now, can Anybody tell me what martensite looks like? Well, in fact, you have already told me uh, somewhere that it's in the form of needles or plates. Okay. Now, a needle looks like this. It's got rotational symmetry, roughly. And a plate looks like a book. It's got a flat face. And when we look at martensite in an optical microscope, Indeed, it looks like plates, which are sharp at the end. I'm afraid the idea that it's needle-shaped is not correct. Okay, now, what are the consequences if my site is needle-shaped? We would be able to observe sections which are almost circular or elliptical, etc. And we don't see that. You know, you see all of these as plates. So these are sections of plates in three dimensions. And if you think about it, you know, the mechanism by which martensite forms involves a deformation, so it's more likely to have a plane which is unchanged during that deformation than a needle, which would have a very, very high strain energy. 
So remember what I told you in the optical microscopy lecture, that you need to be careful about interpreting shape from a two-dimensional image. You need to either do serial sectioning or do a section in which you can observe the plate on two separate surfaces to see its true shape. So, multi-side plates are not needles, but they are plates. Now, if I start with a crystal of austenite, which is present uh, in bulk metal, so it's surrounded by lots of other crystals. In other words, it is constrained, elastically constrained from deforming. Then, when martensite forms, it forms as a thin lenticular plate. Lenticular means lens-like, so it's sharp at its ends, rather like mechanical twins. But if, I, if this is a single crystal of austenite, which is surrounded by air, in other words, a fluid, then you will see a flat interface like this, because this shape arises in an effort to minimize the strain energy associated with the change in shape when you change the crystal structure. So let me explain to you roughly why this shape minimizes the strain as associated with this shape change. So if I draw my parent crystal, gamma, and allow it to transform to martensite, then we see a, a shape change which looks like this. And the shear strain is given by this distance here, divided by this distance, right? Okay. That's the shear strain. The shear strain is constant. Whatever height I calculated at, it's the same value. But the displacements are different. So here, the displacement is smaller than the displacement here and here, right? So if I make my plate thin, then I'm minimizing those displacements. And at the tip, the displacement is zero. So this is the shape which optimizes the strain energy when transformation happens in a constrained uh, environment. But this plane here, the average plane, is exactly the same as the average plane here, and it's called the habit plane of mitosite. So mitosite will form on particular crystallographic planes, which are called the habit planes. Now, the, this will be the first bit of confusion. Okay. If I make a list, of the habit planes of martensite in a variety of materials, then, first of all, the indices of those planes will be irrational. Irrational means that you can't express the indices as integers. So, for example, if I take the square root of 2, then it's 1.41441, it goes on and on and on. Right? Uh, so, that's why I've put here approximate habit plane indices. And so this is not exactly one on one. It's slightly away from one on one. In this case it's really strange. It's two nine five, three fifteen ten, two five two, one on one, and these are not terribly different in chemical composition. Mm -hmm. So the first confusing result from Marty's side is that no matter how accurately we measure these habit planes, they are irrational and they a strange indices even when we make them approximately integers. Why on earth should martensite choose to form on 31510? Okay. It's not a closed pack plane, etc. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. Slit happens on closed pack planes in closed pack directions. Why is martensite forming on these really strange habit planes? So that's the first. Yeah? If you do the same experiment with the same material, does it form exactly the same characters or yeah. does that...? No, it's re highly reproducible. Okay. So when, when I say 31510, of course you will get other crystallographic variants of that, like 15310 yeah. and so forth, but it's highly reproducible. So, so this transformation is, has got a lot of crystallography in it, 
because it's forming by a deformation and that deformation just like slip will happen on a particular plane in a particular direction but the odd thing is the indices of this direction uh, of these planes for example if you said my was still um, F E twenty eight nickel if it was slightly <coughs> different coefficient of nickel the habit planes could be completely it may be yeah it may be that's right okay so this is really strange odd Next thing, uh, if you generate one crystal from another by a deformation, then you expect there to be an orientation relationship between the two. That means a reproducible orientation relationship. And for the vast majority of martensitic transformations in all materials, what will happen is you will tend to have a closed back plane almost parallel and a closed back direction within that plane almost parallel. Okay. Not exactly parallel but almost parallel. So the orientation relationship itself is irrational. Although I have written here that the 0, 1, 1 plane is parallel to the 1, 1, 1 plane, that's not an exact orientation. And this is another variant of it, but you can see they are very similar, that the closed back planes are roughly parallel and closed back directions in those planes are roughly parallel. And you can list uh, a large variety. In the last lecture, I gave you the orientation relationship between body centered cubic and hexagonal closed back margin side in titanium. And again, roughly the closed back planes were parallel, and the closed back direction within those planes was also parallel. But it's not exactly the case. You might have a half degree between the closed back planes. So, this is the second bit of confusing information that the orientation relationship appears as if it's rational, that means closed back planes and directions within those planes, but when you measure it precisely, it is not. It's an irrational orientation relationship. Okay. There's an angle between directions and there's an angle between planes as well. Now, the transformation is athermal. What do we mean by athermal? That means that as I cool below the MS temperature, the amount of margin that I get is a function only of temperature and not of time within the time scale of our observation, of course. If you make an observation at two thousandths of a second, then of course you will see the margin side plate grow. But the volume fraction that you get at any temperature is only a function of that temperature, the maximum volume. So if you look at a time temperature transformation diagram, then let's say this is the margin side start temperature. If I cool here, I will get 50% margin side and no more, no matter how, how long I hold it. And that is expressed in this uh, equation. Uh, I don't want you to worry about the equation itself. You're not going to derive it, but you can see that the volume fraction of margin side is simply related to the undercooling below the MS temperature. And this time doesn't appear in this equation. Now, the physical reason for this is that you have a distribution of nuclei within your austenite, and they get activated more and more, uh, or rather less and less potent nuclei get activated as you undercool below MS. So, as soon as you run out of a certain potency of nuclei, the transformation stops, and then you have to undercool further to stimulate less potent nuclei. So, this, this is well understood, the reason why it's an a-thermal transformation. Now, this is, uh, I'm going to now mention a really important characteristic of mitosite, and that is the structure of the interface and I need you to understand that you can describe an interface in terms of dislocations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a single crystal here and if I insert here a thin wedge, for example an extra half plane due to a dislocation, so it, it starts here and it penetrates here, then it will tilt the two halves of the crystal. So if I insert one extra half plane, then you can see that the misorientation between the two halves will be small. If I insert another one, then the misorientation will increase. So 
That extra half plane represents an edge dislocation. So the presence of that edge dislocation tilts the two halves of the crystal, and we have an interface. So you describe the structure of the interface in terms of dislocations. And the greater the dislocation density you put in the interface, the greater the misorientation. Yeah. So you can see that the misorientation between the two crystals is related to the spacing between those dislocations. Yeah. Are you happy with that? So you can think about an interface as an array of dislocations. If I remove all those extra half planes, it becomes a single crystal again. So this is a physically correct description of in an interface. If you look at the interface in a transmission electron microscope, you will see an array of dislocations. Okay. Now, remember that Martin City transmission can happen extremely rapidly. It can happen at extremely low temperatures, which means that we cannot arbitrarily put any kind of dislocation there for Martin site. It has to be a dislocation which can move without diffusion. So the translation of the interface cannot require diffusion. And therefore, the bogus vector of your dislocation must lie outside of the plane of the interface. Because then, the whole array can translate without diffusion. Right? If the array is like this, then you require diffusion for the dislocations to move because, in effect, these dislocations are climbing. So this is what we call a sessile interface, and this is what we call a glissile interface. A glissile interface can translate without diffusion, just like an individual dislocation can translate within its slip lane without diffusion. So it is a necessary condition that to obtain Martin Cetic transformations, we must be able to create a glissal interface between the parent and the product phases. I'd like you to look at this diagram. And if you look at the line which is going out of the plane of the board, there must be perfect coherency along that line between the parent and the product crystals because I have only got one set of interface dislocations here. If there was any mismatch between the parent and the product, then I would have to have another set of dislocation to accommodate that mismatch. Right? Clearly, there can't be any strain along this dislocation line. The two crystals must match perfectly along that line. Are you happy with that? A line like that we call an invariant line. That means it is a line which is undistorted and unrotated between the two crystals. Now, why is this important? Why is it necessary to have at least one line in the interface which is perfectly coherent? Well, if that wasn't the case, then I would need a set of two dislocations to accommodate the misfit between the two crystals uh, in, uh, in the plane of the interface. Yeah. So, when you have an array of two dislocations inside the interface, they're going to interfere with each other as you translate. Okay? So let me illustrate that interference by looking at two dislocations here, which have different bogus vectors and which have different line vectors. Now you know that when I pass a dislocation through a crystal, okay, and I pass it through the crystal, I create 
a step. Right? What is the magnitude of that step? The burger's back here. So imagine that I had another dislocation going along here. Okay. Um, so if I had a dislocation lying there, when this one cuts this one, it will introduce a step in that dislocation. Okay. Right? And that step will be in the direction of the Burgers vector of this dislocation. Right? So if you look at this diagram, when these two dislocations intersect each other, First of all, on this dislocation, we introduce a step which corresponds to the Burgers vector of this one. Right? And in this dislocation, we introduce a step which corresponds to the Burgers vector of this dislocation. Those steps are called jogs. Okay. Now, notice that this is a screw dislocation. The Burgers vector is parallel to the line vector. And therefore, it can glide in many different planes containing these line vector. But once we have a job, that's no longer true, because we've introduced here an edge component to the dislocation. So intersecting dislocations are troublesome. They can render the interface sessile, yeah, because it introduced these jobs. And that's the reason why we can only tolerate one set of dislocations in the interface between Martin Sad and Austin. And those dislocations must lie along a perfectly coherent line in the interface. Everyone happy with this? Yeah, I know you haven't done jobs before, but it's fairly clear, isn't it? Shout if you don't understand, all right? So this is something that is incredibly important, that in order to get Martin Sadic transformations, we must be able to find one line in the interface which is perfectly coherent. That means it is undistorted and unrotated, an invariant line. So for Martin Sedic transformation to be possible, alpha prime to be possible, it must be possible, it, mu it is necessary, Invariant line exists in alpha prime gamma interface. If you cannot find such a line, then Martin Sedic transformation is impossible. So if someone asks you a question, look, I've got an alloy here is Martin Sedic transformation possible, then you can examine whether it's possible to see a coherent line in the interface. If not, then Martin Sedic transformation is impossible. Glissal interface cannot contain more than one set of dislocations. Why is that? Yeah, they will interfere and create jogs which may be sessile. A Martin Selig transformation is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent into the product phase leaves one line undistorted and unrotated. Distorted means lengthened or contracted, and unro unrotated means even a rotation is not allowed. And such a line we call an invariant line. So the minimum condition for Martin Sedic transformation is that you should be able to change a parent into the product with a deformation, which is an invariant line strain. So the deformation is an invariant line strain. It leaves a line unrotated and undistorted. And of course, if we look at the interface, a plan view of the interface, then you'll see a single array of dislocations and they lie along this invariant line because there is absolutely no misfit along that line. So we don't need another set of dislocations 
to accommodate any misfit parallel to that line. In general, you never need more than two sets of dislocations to accommodate an arbitrary misfit, because you know, by defining two vectors, you define the whole plane. Now, because we have this single array of dislocations and there's a lot of coherency along that line, the interface energy per unit area for Martinsite is quite small. So, this is the austenite Martinsite interface energy and it's of the order of 0.2 joules per meter squared. And you compare that with the surface energy of window glass, and it's about one joule per meter squared. So, because this is an amorphous material, uh, a twin boundary, which is a very coherent boundary, because everything matches at the twin boundary, 0.2 joules per meter squared, and a general grain boundary in a metallic material would have an interfacial energy of about 0.8 joules per meter squared. So, mighty side interfaces will be low energy interfaces because they have a high level of coherency inside the interface. And that coherency is necessary for Martin Zedek transformation to be possible. Now, we've talked about this deformation which carries the parent into the product phase. And we need to understand a bit more about the exact nature of that deformation. If I take a sample of austenite and I polish it completely flat, and then I transform it to Martin site, then the surface changes. This is a Nomaski interference micrograph, and the color represents height. You can see that corresponding to every plate, we've rumpled the surface. And quantitatively, that change in shape, we can measure accurately, and it's as follows. Here are three deformations which leave <laughs> this plane completely unchanged. So this plane is undistorted and unrotated. It's an invariant plane. This deformation involves an extension normal to the plane, which is essentially a volume change. And the Poisson's ratio is zero, so we don't get any contraction. So beryllium is a metal like this, which has a Poisson's ratio of almost zero. This is a shear. For example, when we have slip deformation, it doesn't change anything in the slip plane, but we have a shear deformation. If you combine the two, then we get the most general invariant plane strain. That means this deformation leaves this plane undistorted and unrotated. We have a volume change due to the transformation from austenite to martensite. And we have the shear deformation, and these are typical magnitudes of delta and S. Now, can anybody tell me the magnitude of an elastic strain in, in a metal? You've done, you've done a bit of elasticity, mm -hmm. haven't you? You've done strain tensors. Mm -hmm. Yeah? 0.5%. Sorry? 0.5%. So that's 0 0.005. Yeah, that, that, that's about right. 10 to the minus 3, roughly. Okay. Now look at the magnitudes of the strains here. This is not a percentage. This is an absolute strain. Massive deformation. So clearly, this is a strain energy dominated transformation. And that's the reason why it forms as a thin plate. So when we observe the shape deformation, the shape deformation is an invariant plane strain. So it's a, it's a shear and a volume expansion normal to that plane. We can measure this very accurately. Now, that could be really good news, because the minimum condition is that we needed one line coherent in the interface. We've got a whole plane here, which is unrotated and undistorted. So it appears like we have an infinite set of invariant lines in the interface. Okay. In other words, a coherent interface. This is just to show you that, uh, you know, it is because of this massive deformation that we have a thin plate. Uh, the strain energy per unit volume depends on the thickness over the length of the plate. Now, if I 
drew a stress strain curve here. Okay. What is the strain energy per unit volume? Area under the curve, yeah. which is half sigma epsilon, which is the same as half times the elastic modulus times epsilon squared. So you can see where these, these terms come from, the square terms and the elastic modulus of the parent phase. And this term I explained to you is important because by making the plate thin, you minimize the displacements. Right, so let me just summarize and finish off today's lecture that we haven't solved why the habit planes are really strange. 3, 10, 15, and irrational. This orientation relationship is also strange. Although the, the close back planes and close back directions within those planes are approximately parallel, they're not exactly parallel. This is also confusing. The shape deformation is an invariant plane straight, and in the next lecture, I will show you that it is impossible to transform austenite into martensite with a deformation which is an invariant plane strain. So you should be really confused at this stage. And we'll solve all that in the next lecture. Okay. Yeah? Yes. On the previous um, you've shown the, the Martin side plane. They have it plane one to the middle of that. Yeah, it's the average plane, yeah. But, but, and is the orientation of that to the so the square that you've drawn there, is that like to you to have those both included in the formula, that must be correct. How, how is that then for irrational and complete? How can you not tell what the habit plane is going to be? Because when you, yeah. Because if you're going to have like an invariant, you're going to have to have an invariant line in the formula. That right. has to be included in the original physical. But then the habit plane is, is, is related to the invariant line. Yeah, and it must contain the invariant line. And yet it's irrational. Yes, exactly right. When the invariant line is not. So no, the invariant line is also irrational. I, I haven't mentioned that, but we will do that in the next lecture. It, it can be an irrational line which is perfectly coherent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, no, you see, I mean, the thing is that, you know, it doesn't make sense to talk about a 3, 10, 15 plane where yeah. we have planes of atoms, yeah? Yeah. But if you, if you make steps between planes, then the average plane can be 3, 10, 15. Okay. And similarly, the average line can be an irrational line. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. So the, 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 the invariant line in the original crystal bands isn't like a, a, in the direction of, say, the invariant line, you cannot talk about it being in the original crystal because you have to have two crystals to define the invariant line. Right. Yeah. Now, just before you go, we haven't explained this part, the twinning part, and, and we will see that this comes out as a natural consequence of the solution of those difficulties. 